Hello, welcome back. We are jumping ahead in the book now. We are going to chapter 22. Um, that chapter is devoted to industrial glass making, and we're going to spend the next few lectures uh, dealing with glass technology. Um, so far in the course, we've learned a lot about different glass compositional families, their structure, their properties, and some of their applications. And now we're going to learn how we actually make them at an industrial scale. Uh, so this lecture, lecture 22, is called Fundamentals of Inorganic Glass Making. And this is meant to be kind of a, a general introduction to this topic of how we make a glass at an industrial scale. Uh, it all starts, of course, with um, uh, glass melting. So getting our batch materials having them mixed and then converting them from um, their crystalline uh, raw material state, this uh, batch into molten glass. And this is done through heating of the batch as well as chemical reactions and fining that occur uh, during the batch to melt conversion process. Uh, fining is just a uh, removal of bubbles because um, in some cases, some batch materials will evolve gases as they are melted and the fining process just indicates removal of those bubbles. Now, there are many uh, different important considerations for uh, glass melting. Uh, first is the composition of the glass. We need to make sure that we get the right combination of batch materials and the right quantities such that uh, when they are melted, they produce the desired composition of the glass. Next is the melting setup. This includes uh, what are the temperatures that we're operating our furnace at? What is the, the refractory material of the walls of our furnace? Uh, next is the raw material selection and purity. We need to make sure that we've got um, a sufficient quantity of our batch materials um, that have sufficiently high purity uh, and that we've got an appropriate uh, grain size distribution for those batch materials. And using that, um, the data from the suppliers, we need to do the appropriate batch calculations to ensure that they are mixed in appropriate quantities to get the desired glass composition. Then, of course, uh, when melting happens, there are reactions that occur between uh, different batch materials, and these reactions help to facilitate the melting process. Uh, at the same time, gases are being released um, for their forming bubbles. They are being uh, evolved to the top of the melt. This is the fining process. And another important consideration is redox equilibria because different species in the glass, as well as different atmospheres that can be used during glass melting, can create either oxidizing environment or a reducing environment. And this can have an impact on the structure of the glass and also on the color of the glass. For example, iron oxide can exist in, in either FeO or Fe2O3 states, and that influences the color of the resulting uh, glass product. Now, when we're considering what is included in the batch, there are several different categories of batch components. Uh, the predominant batch component is the network former. Uh, the network former forms the majority of the glass in most cases. This is what creates the network of the glass. And as we know from our previous lectures, uh, the most commonly used ones include silica. Um, and this usually comes from quartz sand. Uh, B2O3, boric oxide, alumina, uh, as well as P2O5 phosphate. Now, if it's only, say, silica, the melting temperatures would be too high, and therefore we need to incorporate fluxes into the batch in order to lower the melting temperature. Um, and lowering the melting temperature helps to improve the meltability, also make it easier to homogenize the glass sample, and the typical fluxes include network modifiers like sodium oxide, potassium oxide, calcium oxide, or magnesium oxide, lead oxide in uh, the so-called crystal glass uh, with high refractive index. Uh, lead also acts as a flux in that case. Uh, B2O3, even though it's a network former, it also acts as a flux because it is lowering the melting temperature compared to silica in borosilicate glasses. Um, then we have fining agents. Fining agents are special chemicals that are added to the batch 
to aid in the removal of bubbles. Uh, bubbles can be classified as either seeds or blisters. Uh, seeds are the smaller gaseous bubbles and blisters are the larger gaseous bubbles. Uh, of course, we want to remove all of these bubbles during the manufacturing process and finding agents can help to uh, make that happen. And um, while we're in chapter 22, we will go through the details about how finding agents work. Uh, for now, a few finding agents include arsenic oxide, cerium oxide, antimony oxide, and tin oxide. There are also colorants and decolorants. Uh, these are usually transition metal oxides or rare earth oxides, and they can be added to the batch either to create a desired color or to help balance the balance out existing color to make it uh, give it more of a gray appearance. Um, and then finally, uh, there's colored. Colored is just crushed recycled glass, and typically about twenty percent of the batch is colored. Um, Cullet can have two sources. Uh, Cullet can come in through recycling streams. So every time you put a glass bottle out for recycling, that gets crushed up into cullet, and that cullet goes into glass factories and is put uh, back in the melter together with uh, crystalline batch materials in order to be recycled into new glass products. So one of the sources of cullet comes from the external recycling stream. Another source of cullet comes internally from uh, the factory itself because any glass that doesn't pass quality control for whatever reason uh, basically gets dropped down into a bin in the basement of the, the factory and that glass gets crushed up and then sent back up to the melter. And so it gets recycled just um, within the factory itself. So cullet can come internally from glasses that fail quality control or externally through external uh, recycling streams and that is usually about 20 percent that gets added to the, your batch your other batch materials that are used um, the network formers the fluxes finding agent and any colorant or decolorant that might be present this shows a schematic diagram of uh, a typical uh, industrial uh, glass forming uh, process here where basically you've got um, bins that contain different batch materials. So for example, um, maybe quartz sand, soda ash, limestone, feldspar, um, whatever the batch materials are, uh, they are brought into the factory. They go into a batch mixer where they are also mixed with uh, cullet. And so if it's if you're making soda lime silicate, the cullet would be soda lime cullet, and that would get mixed with the uh, quartz sand, soda ash, and limestone. And so you have a thoroughly mixed batch to aid in the homogenization process of the glass belt itself. Now this batch gets fed into the melter and this needs to be fed into the melter at a controlled rate uh, because you need to make sure that the rate of batch material going into the melter um, is commensurate with the rate of glass being produced at the other, um, at the other side. Um, and usually this is fed into the melter using a screw feeder. So the batch gets sent into a screw feeder. The uh, rate of the of batch being fed into the melt is governed by uh, the rate at which the screw feeder is operating. That delivers the mixed batch material into the melter and it comes in over the melt surface of the, gl of the glass. And now the melter is, uh, it's huge. It's about the size of either a small room or a very large room, depending upon the scale of industrial glass melting that's being done here. These are designed to continuously melt glass and then continuously deliver it into the forming process. The glass melter needs to be made out of a ceramic refractory material that can withstand the high temperatures of glass melting, which is around 1500 degrees C for soda lime silicate glass. Um, and it needs to be corrosion resistant. So um, it would minimize the reactions between the molten glass at high temperatures and the refractory bricks themselves. 
Now, the highest temperature that the, that the molten glass sees is at the exit part of the melter. This is where the finer is. Um, in the finer, this is where we bring the molten glass to the highest temperature that it will see during this process because the highest temperature corresponds to the lowest viscosity, and a lower viscosity means that bubbles can rise up um, faster. And so the finer um, is meant to help accelerate the fining process to get rid of the bubbles. Uh, when the molten glass exits the finer, uh, then it goes into the forming equipment. And there's different types of forming equipment depending upon the shapes of the glass that we're trying to make. If we're trying to make flat glass or fibers or glass tubing or glass bottles or jars, these are all different types of forming processes. And we'll be going into detail on some of these forming processes in future lectures. Um, after the glass is formed and cooled, then it can uh, go into an annealer if annealing is necessary to help relieve any stresses. Um, this would generally be a type of tube furnace where uh, the glass can more slowly cool around its annealing point. There can be any other type of finishing operation that needs to take uh, place, um, such as polishing, for example. And then the glass would go through a quality control and inspection. Anything that doesn't pass quality control gets dropped into that bin in the basement of the factory, and that gets crushed up into cullet, and the cullet goes back into the mixer. Everything that does pass quality control then gets packed up and uh, sent to the warehouse and then shipped off to the customer. So this is kind of a, a general schematic of some of the key steps of um industrial glass melting. The main parts are the batch mixing, uh, the melting, followed by fining, uh, and then the forming, and then any post-forming operations that are done to the glass. Now recall that anytime we are trying to develop a new glass, there are a lot of properties that we care about. Uh, many of these properties affect the performance of the product. And so there's a whole set of properties that we need to meet in order for the glass to be appropriate for use by the customer. But there's also another set of properties that we need to meet in order for the glass to be manufacturable at an industrial scale. And some of those include uh, the liquidus temperature and the viscosity curve, or putting them together. It's the liquidus viscosity, which means the viscosity of the glass forming melt at its liquidus temperature. Um, this is important because this tells us the resistance of the glass um, to crystallization. In other words, a higher viscosity at the liquidus temperature indicates that the kinetics of the, the molten glass are slower at the point where the glass is thermodynamically favorable to crystallize. So the liquidus temperature tells us where the glass is thermodynamically favorable to crystallize at any temperature below the liquidus temperature, it's favored to crystallize at any temperature above the liquidus temperature, you're safe against crystallization. And if you evaluate the viscosity at the liquidus temperature, that tells you how fast or how slow the kinetics are. So higher viscosity means slower kinetics, which means greater resistance to crystallization, or in other words, it takes longer time for crystallization to happen. Uh, we also care about all the melting temperatures, the forming temperatures, uh, the compatibility of the molten glass with the refractory materials. If we are using electrical melting, and uh, a big trend in furnace design is moving away from gas towards electric, then the resistivity of the molten glass is very important because we need to make sure that um, if you've got two electrodes, um, with a voltage between the two electrodes that the low resistance path is actually the molten glass and not going through the refractory itself because we want to make sure that we heat up the molten glass in our electrical furnace instead of heating up the refractory material, which could lead to a failure of um, the melting tank. Uh, we also need to make sure that we get good quality with our melts. So that means minimizing defects like uh, gaseous bubbles, minimizing solid defects, um, ensuring that we've got complete melting and com complete homogenization of the molten glass. And of course, cost is always um, important when it comes to industrial manufacturing, because we have to make sure that we can uh, manufacture 
uh, this glass at a both high enough quality and low enough cost for it to be uh, commercially successful. And of course, if you change the composition of the glass, it's not just one of these properties that changes on its own, but all of the properties change simultaneously. And so we need to consider all of these properties when designing new glasses, both product facing attributes, as well as manufacturing related attributes. Now, in the remainder of this lecture, I'd like to focus on one of the most important properties for glass manufacturing, and that is liquidus temperature. Liquidus temperature is a well-defined thermodynamic uh, property of the system that gives us the highest temperature at which a crystal is in equilibrium with the system. What this means is that if we are at any temperature above the liquidus temperature, there is no crystal in equilibrium. We've got a, a liquid and we don't have to worry about crystallization. But at some point, um, the supercooled liquid is, is or the liquid is going to be cooled in below its liquidus temperature into the supercooled liquid regime, which means that crystallization is thermodynamically favored. And if we're making a glass product, we need to suppress that crystallization, which means that we need to design a system that has as high of a viscosity as possible at its liquidus temperature to slow down those kinetics of crystallization and also ensure that we've uh, cooled the sample fast enough to avoid crystallization. Now, if we want to understand liquidus temperature, we need to turn to our phase diagrams. And so understanding thermodynamic phase diagrams is critical in the design of new glasses. For example, if we consider just the phase, the thermodynamic phase diagram of pure SiO2. So everything on this phase diagram has the same chemistry. It is all SiO2. And the phase diagram has pressure on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And you can see that silica can exist in many different phases. If we are at high temperatures, we have liquid in equilibrium. But if we are at lower temperatures, different uh, crystalline polymorphs of silica um, may be uh, favored. So if we start off at atmospheric pressure, at very low pressure here, um, at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, the thermodynamically stable form of silica is alpha quartz. So if you go to the beach, uh, the vast majority of the sand there will be alpha quartz. Um, when that alpha quartz is heated, it undergoes a polymorphic phase transition from alpha quartz to beta quartz. Uh, if you heat it up even more, it converts to tritomite and then to cristobalite. And finally, it is cristobalite that will melt and form liquid silica. And that happens uh, above 1700 degrees Celsius um, when the, the cristobalite converts into um, the liquid. And of course, you know from your thermodynamics course that all of these phase boundaries correspond to having equal Gibbs free energies between the two different phases. So at this melting point of cristobalite, this is where the cristobalite and the liquid have identical Gibbs free energies. So that's where this phase transition occurs. So this is what happens in the normal case if you're at atmospheric pressure and just increase the temperature. Um, if we go up the pressure axis, there are uh, different um, phases of silica that can perform at higher pressures, including cosite at these intermediate pressures and stichovite at really high pressures. Now, for most glass manufacturing, we don't care about the high pressure side because most glass manufacturing is done at the Earth's crust and at the surface of the Earth under atmospheric pressure. And pressure really isn't a variable then in glass manufacturing. Um, the high pressure part of this phase diagram is more useful in geosciences because geoscientists are dealing with high pressures um, as you get deeper into the Earth. So this single component phase diagram, we mostly care about the temperature axis and not so much the pressure axis. So when we add another chemical component to the system, for example, if we look at the sodium oxide silica phase diagram, which is now a binary phase diagram because there are two components, sodium oxide and silica, 
What we do is we get rid of the pressure axis and consider the phase diagram where everything here is at atmospheric pressure. So now the y-axis is the temperature axis and the x-axis is a compositional axis. Uh, in this case, it is the molar percent of silica. So 100% silica is the right-hand axis. And as you move away from that, if you move leftward, we are adding more and more sodium oxide to the system. Now, the liquidus temperature is given by um, this surface shown here, this curve, where this shows at any for any composition, this is the highest temperature at which a crystal is in equilibrium. So any place above this liquidus line, uh, you have only liquids that are in equilibrium and no crystals. But as soon as the system drops below the liquidus temperature, that's where at least one crystal becomes in equilibrium. So if we, were, if we are at pure silica here at the low temperatures, the equilibrium is quartz, which you can see here. And then if we heat up uh, the quartz sand, this converts to tritomite. And then if you heat it up even more at 1470 degrees C, it converts to cristobalite. And then cristobalite melts at 1723 degrees C. And so any uh, silica at atmospheric pressure at a temperature above 1723 degrees C will be in the molten state at equilibrium. Now, one of the things that, that happens when you add a different component like sodium oxide is that the liquidus temperature drops because we are destabilizing the, um, the pure silica crystal by adding some other component to it. So as we add silica, uh, sodium oxide, the liquidus temperature comes down and it goes through a minimum here. That minimum is called a eutectic, that is either a local or a global minimum in the liquidus temperature with respect to composition. And eutectics are very important for glass making because eutectics tend to be very good glass formers. They are good glass formers because at the eutectic points, the liquidus temperature is a minimum. It's either a local or a global minimum, which means that the liquid phase is at equilibrium over a wider range of temperatures. So you can cool the system down uh, to much lower temperatures before a crystal becomes an equilibrium. So here, if we consider this eutectic here, uh, you can see that this eutectic is occurring at 793 degrees Celsius. Compare that to pure silica, where the liquidus temperature is 1723 degrees Celsius. So the um, liquidus temperature drops by over 900 degrees C by moving from pure silica to this eutectic composition, which is a binary combination of sodium oxide and silica. And if you add additional components to this, you might be able to decrease the li liquidus temperature even more. Um, this is uh, you know, very important for glass manufacturing because what this means is if we are at the eutectic composition, we don't have to worry about crystals forming until you cool below uh, 793 degrees Celsius. Now, if we add another component to a phase diagram, instead of a binary phase diagram, now it becomes a ternary phase diagram. We represent these by these uh, ternary phase diagrams, which are triangular in shape. This shows the ternary phase diagram for a sodium oxide alumina silica system. So this is a sodium alumina silicate glass. And the contours that you see here indicate how the liquidus temperature varies as a function of composition on this ternary phase diagram. So if you go up here to the peak, this peak here is pure silica, and we know that pure, pure silica has a liquidus temperature of 1723 degrees C. If you move away from pure silica and add sodium or alumina to it, the liquidus temperature is decreasing. This contour shows where the liquidus temperature is 1550 degrees C, or 1400 degrees C, 1200, and so on. If you are along one of the edges of the phase diagram, for example, the left-hand edge here between sodium oxide and silica, this left-hand edge is just a binary mixing of sodium oxide and silica. And so that liquidus surface would be identical to what is being shown on this binary phase diagram.
So starting off at that peak with silica, adding sodium, decreases the liquidus temperature, it goes through these two eutectics, and then comes back up with increasing amount of sodium. And that's exactly what we see here going from silica, lowering the liquidus temperature, it goes through a, uh, a minimum here, the eutectic, a second nearby minimum, and then it starts to increase again. The binary mixture of alumina and silica would be the right-hand edge. And then anything that combines uh, sodium and alumina and silica is going to be in the interior of the triangle. Now, this phase diagram is also showing us the primary devit phase, meaning the primary phase that is devitrified when you initially cool the system below the liquidus temperature. In this very high silica regime, the primary devit phase is crystobalite. So if you are on this contour line of 1550 degrees C in liquidus, if you cool slightly below that, the first crystalline phase that will appear is crystobalite. If you move away from silica a bit, instead of crystobalite, the primary devit phase becomes tritomite, uh, which is still a pure SiO2, but it's a polymorph that occurs at lower temperatures compared to crystobalite. Now, if you go over to the higher alumina side, the primary devit phase becomes mullite because mullite is a just a combination of alumina and silica. And if you go more towards pure alumina, the primary devit phase becomes corundum, which is just crystalline alumina. If you go closer to sodium, different sodium silicate or sodium aluminosilicate phases will become the primary devit phases. Uh, you can see here Na2O, 2SiO2 is the primary devit phase along this binary. But if we move into the interior, uh, now albite becomes the primary devit phase. And albite is a mineral that contains sodium oxide, alumina, and silica. Another mineral that contains all three components is nepheline. Nepheline is somewhat lower in silica compared to albite. Um, and what we see is that at this phase boundary between albite and nepheline, this is um, a peritectic line. So it's not a eutectic, but a peritectic line uh, where there is a relative minimum here on the boundary between these two phases. The liquidus temperature is actually fairly low along this boundary and it, it drains into a eutectic that occurs right here on the space diagram. This eutectic is at 732 degrees Celsius. This is a very low temperature eutectic for a system like this. And what this means is that optimized glass formation can occur in the system around this eutectic, so around 732 degrees C, and in nearby regions along the peritectic between albite and nepheline. So a lot of commercial glasses in the sodium aluminum silicate system are designed to be around um, this point here, around this eutectic, uh, because it is uh, such a good glass forming region. Now, one of the things that the eutectic also indicates is that um, if you are in a ternary phase diagram, the eutectic point means that there are three crystalline phases in equilibrium with each other, each other plus the liquid phase. So at this eutectic point right here, there are the three crystals that are in equilibrium are this uh, sodium silicate crystal, the albite crystal, and the nepheline crystal. And then the fourth phase that is in equilibrium is the liquid. So what the eutectic means is that the Gibbs free energy for all four of those phases are all identical at that eutectic point. And that's, that is what gives us that minimum in the liquidus temperature. So this is a very propitious region of the phase diagram for designing glasses. And in fact, all of the Corning Gorilla glasses, for example, are all designed around this particular region in the sodium aluminum silicate phase diagram. Now, given the importance of phase diagrams and the design of new glass compositions, you need to make sure that you've got access to good phase diagrams. The best source for access to phase diagrams is the this collaboration between the American Ceramic Society, ACERS, and the National Institute for Standards and, and uh, Technology, NIST. So the ACERS NIST phase diagram database um, is available as software and if you are with me here at Penn State, our library of uh, earth and mineral sciences 
has a subscription to the ACERS NIST phase diagram database. And you can access this by going to libraries.psu.edu and logging into it from there. If you are at a different university or at a company, uh, please check with your librarian to see if you have access to this ACERS NIST phase diagram database, um, because this is an outstanding um, a collection of phase diagram data. What you do is you go into this, just put in the system that where you want to see the phase diagram. So just type in, say, Na2O, Al203, SiO2, and then this will pull up all the available phase diagrams um, for that system. And it gives you the references and it lets you read the numbers off the phase diagram. So this is a really great tool. Um, so please try to access that if you are able to. Some of the most useful phase diagrams for glass manufacturing include the sodium aluminum silicate phase diagram, which is the one that we were just studying. Uh, this is the basis for um, most chemically strengthened glasses. There's the calcium aluminum silicate phase diagram, which is the basis for most display glasses. Uh, magnesium aluminum silicate is also very useful for display glasses. Soda lime silicate, which is, of course, for soda lime. Sodium borosilicate, which is the basis for Pyrex and other um, commonly used borosilicate glasses. The titania silica phase, uh, phase diagram is important for uh, ultra low expansion or ULE glass, which has a zero um, thermal expansion coefficient. And then the calcium aluminate phase diagram is useful for uh, getting that really narrow eutectic where um, these high modulus um, calcium aluminate glasses can be made. All right, this lecture was meant to be a general overview of um, some of the key considerations uh, for glass manufacturing. Um, I wanted to particularly emphasize the importance of the liquidus temperature. Next time, we are going to deal with details of batching, melting, and fining operations. So I will see you then. Thanks, everyone.